Hello, everyone, and welcome to the PEX Network's webinar with iGraphics. Today, our conversation will be about process mining and modeling, the yin and yang of process intelligence, probably one of the best titles in PEX Network history. I'm your host, Francesca DiMeglio. I'd like to introduce you to our guest, Maxwell Smith, Senior Director of Product Marketing at iGraphics. Before I turn it over to Max, I must do a little bit of housekeeping. First, we're delighted to have such a great audience and we want you to be very much involved in the conversation. You're welcome to use the live chat function to get to know one another and share your stories. In fact, right now you can tell us where you're joining from. We'd prefer that you use the Q&A function to ask your questions of Max. Please send those questions through the Q&A button that you'll see at the bottom of your screen and keep the questions coming because we are ready and willing to answer them. Um, and without further ado, I will hand this over to you, Max. Awesome, friend. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your busy days to come and join the webinar. Um, we certainly really appreciate it. Um, I hope we get have something interesting here for you today. Um, so let's jump into it. Uh, throughout the webinar today, you're going to uh, you can expect to learn what process intelligence is, um, why you should use it, how to effectively use it, um, and also some tips and tricks for being successful along the way. Two of the key technologies of process intelligence uh, are process mining and process modeling, and those are the two we're going to be focused on today. Um, and these really together form the yin and yang of process intelligence. Uh, one note, as I go through, you'll hear me say process modeling a lot. You might uh, have heard it called EBPA, BPM. Um, so just so we're all on the same page, when I say process modeling, that's what I'm referring to. Uh, so with that, let's let's jump in. If I can get my, there we go. Okay, so I'm Max Smith, uh, Senior Director of Product Marketing here at iGraphics. Um, I've spent over a decade building, designing, and bringing software products to market. Um, I really have a passion for market research. I love understanding uh, all the cool technologies that are coming out, how they're being used, how customers are getting value from them. Uh, I have experience with data quality, data management, data analytics products, as well as process mining, process modeling, and process simulation. I also have a passion for customer research. I love hearing from audience members like you. This is me presenting to you, uh, but I love hearing from you. As Fran said, please put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, we have time at the end for Q&A, and I'd love to have a discussion. So before we really jump into it, uh, let's talk about why process intelligence. Um, at, at its core, we, we think that a business is the sum of its processes. Uh, those are back office processes, front office processes. But if you break it down, a business really just consists of all the different processes used to execute. And great process can build lasting transformation. Um, this is particularly important. I feel like digital transformation has been a buzzword for quite a few years at this point, but it seems to be having a, a renaissance of sorts, particularly with the advent of Gen AI and all the, the hype around AI. So great process builds lasting transformation, um, but bad process is expensive. And so with process intelligence, you can deliver the business processes of the future today. And those businesses, those business processes of the future will help your organization improve productivity, reduce costs, and ensure compliance. Um, in terms of improving productivity, this will enable you to get more done or create higher quality products with the same amount of resources that you currently have. If you want to reduce costs, it's the inverse. You want to keep volume, pace, and quality stable while you're decreasing the investment. Typically, we see that organizations are trying to do both of these at the same time. I'm, heard, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, uh, do more with less over and over again. So it's a combination of the two. But there is a third important point, which is ensuring compliance. This is both with internal policy that you have, as well as external regulation. Uh, because if your processes aren't compliant, your organization faces substantial financial and reputational risk. So that's why we're talking about process intelligence today. Uh, let's look a little bit at what process intelligence actually is. There's two ways you can look at it. Uh, the first is as a concept, and that's really everything you need to understand about the who, what, why, when, and where of, a, of your processes. And as a software category, it's really a combination of existing technologies that you might be familiar with. Uh, things like data analytics tools, process and task mining, process modeling, process simulation, and automation. And to be fair, I think that the definition of process intelligence is still being fully fleshed out. I think we have a solid core, but the dust hasn't quite settled yet. So this is this is the current view of the world, uh, in my opinion. 
Um, some keynotes about process intelligence are that these technologies that I mentioned are much better together. Uh, so you could use these uh, technologies separately um, and you can still drive a tremendous amount of value, but you get exponential value when you use them together in an integrated fashion. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit uh, throughout the webinar today. The second is that process intelligence enables this shift from the as is to the to be. And this is also- hey, Max, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We are unable to see your slides. Have, uh, have you been unable so far? Yes. Okay, well, thank you for stopping me now. Um, let me- yes, Apologies for that. We were unsure if, if you were meant for that or not. Okay, well, I am so sorry to the audience for not having shared this at this point. Um, if I just want to go back uh, quickly, we talked about why process intelligence, delivering the business processes of the future today, and those future processes can help improve productivity, reduce costs, and ensure compliance. And before I jump to this current slide, can you confirm for me, please, that you can you can still see it? We can see it. Excellent. Again, so sorry, everyone. That's how you know it's live. Uh, so again, um, I, I talked about these technologies are, are better together. They produce exponential value that way, enabling the shift from the as is to the to be. This is a very important topic for today's webinar. Um, the as is how your processes are operating in reality and then to be where you want to get them. Uh, the challenge with making that change is that the change is inherently risky. Um, it comes with a tremendous amount of both financial and reputational risk. You can be betting on new business models, new ways of work, um, and they may or may not pan out, right? So for that change to be positive, you need it to be objective. You need to be able to measure it and you need to be able to focus on it uh, to make meaningful, uh, to get meaningful results from that change. And lastly, process intelligence helps to make the complex simple. Um, you can improve what you don't understand. So a, a core tenet of process intelligence is enabling you to discover how your processes are operating, give you visibility that you wouldn't otherwise have, but also importantly, uh, it, it manifests this convergence of perspectives. Uh, so we, if you look at a process, which in reality is operating a certain way, if you're an executive looking at that process, you probably care about different things. You probably view it in a different way. If you're a risk and compliance team, if you're a line of business team, you all see the the a, a given process through different angles, different perspectives, if you will. And those different perspectives are a common source of a challenge that we see in process improvement, which is having an aligned vision of what that process looks like and how you're going to change it, it causes a lot of communication issues and silos between departments. So process intelligence can really help with converging those perspectives and making the seemingly complex topic actually quite simple. So we talked about the why and the what of process intelligence, and this slide can effectively be the how. Um, it's how, you, how process intelligence manifests itself into process improvement, which is ultimately going to give you the uh, improved productivity, reduced costs, and ensured compliance that we talked about just a moment ago. Um, each of these steps that I'm about to walk through requires a blend of different teams and people, as well as technology, as well as methodologies, but it doesn't have to be complex. It's actually quite simple. Um, and you in the audience, uh, there's probably a number of different uh, audience members that are different stages of their maturity journey. And that's completely okay. Um, this, this process is true no matter where you're at. Um, it's cyclical. Within a specific process, you're going to go through iterations of this. And as you scale to different processes, different areas of the business, you're also going to go through this process. So it doesn't matter where you are today. Um, so with that all out of the way, I'm going to actually walk through this framework, um, which is the objective for process improvement is discovering how your processes run today designing how those processes should run tomorrow, what the ideal version of them is, and then optimizing the processes to close the gap. Again, you want to transition from as is to to be. So within the discover step, the, the core pieces of this are you want to gain objective visibility into how your processes run in reality. Objective is a, is a key point here. You don't want to be subjective. Uh, we're not looking for opinions. We're looking for real data-based facts about how our processes are operating. Through this discovery step, pardon me, you'll be able to uncover inefficiencies, bottlenecks, and other opportunities for improvement, um, as well as if you already are aware of some of these or have a perception that there's opportunities for improvement, you'll be able to validate and measure them. 
In the design stage, you're looking to build that future state process. And importantly, this should be collaborative. So again, this, this combines perspectives from process operators, a process excellence center of excellence, if you have it, executives, line of business, risk and compliance teams. Um, and as you're designing that, there's a number of changes from the as is that you're going to want to make. Um, you might want to hire people. You might want to employ automation. You might need to change the process to comply with the regulation. You want to be able to quantify what the impact of that change is going to be before you make it. Because uh, if you make the investment up front and it doesn't pan out, uh, well, it costs money, it costs time, and you lose credibility, right? And lastly, during this phase, you want to ensure that those processes are compliant with external regulations and internal policies. This is an often overlooked but very important part of process design. Uh, the risk and compliance teams will certainly appreciate it as they're involved. And then lastly, as we're optimizing the processes, closing the gap between the two, you want to, first of all, take action, you know, run a change management program that can involve uh, cultural change, it can involve implementing technology like automation, but overall, you're executing continuous improvement based on those uh, opportunities that you've identified and then validated. And you're also continuously monitoring to safeguard against future inefficiencies, because maybe when you did the analysis, a particular challenge wasn't there, but things have changed. Uh, so you need to be aware of those so you can safeguard the ROI that you're getting from those changes. So I'm going to take a pause here. Um, we have a little bit of a poll for you. So I want to understand where you are today, um, because I'm about to dive into the technology in a bit more detail, but it'll help if I understand where you're at so I can uh, really tailor it to what you're using. So with that, um, perfect. Awesome. Read my mind. Thank you so much for bringing up the poll. I'll just give you, let's say, 30 seconds or so to answer this. The question is, which technologies have you already invested in? Um, and importantly, this is a select all that apply. Um, the options are integrated process intelligence, process mining, process modeling slash eBPA or BPM, process simulation, and lastly, diagramming tools. And by that, I mean something like Visio or Lucid, where you might be drawing a process diagram, but it's not uh, truly a full-blown process model. All right, maybe we give it five more seconds and then we can look at the results and move on to the rest of the webinar. Okay, excellent. Um, so I'm not sure if everyone can see the results, but I will, um, I'm happy to read them out loud. Uh, so by and large, most of the audience has some sort of diagramming tool in place, 73% of the audience. Um, that's great. Some sort of Visio or Lucid. So you have a way to at least get a picture of your processes, some method of communication. Um, next up is process modeling. Um, so you have some sort of design solution, also great, followed by process mining, 33% or about a third of the audience. And then process simulation and integrated process intelligence uh, come in fourth and fifth respectively, which is great um, because you're attending this webinar to learn a little bit more about process intelligence. So it's good to see that everybody's not already an expert. Um, that makes the rest of my uh, webinar very relevant. So if we move on, there we go. So on this slide, um, so it, I, I guess maybe before I jump into this, since only about a third of the audience leverages modeling and about a third of the audience leverages mining, maybe I should explain what these technologies are a little bit. Um, and I'll try to keep it short. So process mining effectively looks at the event logs from the systems that you're already using, your ERPs, your CRMs, your human resources systems, and reconstructs processes based on the data that exists in those systems already. Again, it's already captured in event logs, you know, a digital trail of breadcrumb, breadcrumbs, if you will. Um, and then process modeling uh, is where you can build a process for the, all of you that are familiar with the diagramming tools, uh, uh, Lucio, or sorry, Visio, Lucid, uh, slip of the tongue there. Um, you'll see a picture of a process, but when you upgrade to process modeling, it's about bringing in additional business architecture elements. So it's things like strategies and goals for the business, the assets that are used, uh, requirements of the process, regulations, people, a racy matrix. So it's really uh, turning those diagrams into full-blown models. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, I, th I think that that's probably all we need to move forward with explaining the modeling. So that's a little bit on mining and modeling. We'll talk a little bit more as we go through. But the purpose of this slide is uh, really about where to start. Um, so some of you have started with mining. Some of you have started with modeling. Uh, maybe it's the same people that have both in the audience. Uh, it, it, it's hard to know. Uh, but there isn't actually a right place to start. Um, this slide is about where to start if you haven't already started somewhere. And in the next couple of slides, we're going to talk about if you've started with one, how you move to the other, and what the benefits of doing so are. So on the uh, for each of these, um, there's kind of a key consideration. And the considerations aren't mutually exclusive. It's entirely possible that some of these things might both be true. Um, but these are just general guidelines for where, where you might want to start. Um, you might want to use process mining if you don't have a preconceived notion of what you need to improve and how to discover. So you know that the process needs to be improved, but the challenges aren't immediately visible um, because process mining doesn't expect a question to be answered. You can simply see the process as it is and discover what's wrong with it. You can compare that with something like a BI tool where you need to write a query. You need to have a question in mind to figure out what kind of answer you're trying to get. So process mining doesn't have that preconceived notion. Whereas with process mon modeling, you might have a mandate for what to improve and, and you need to val validate it. Um, and in that case, it can be really useful to understand the context, again, those systems, resources, people. Um, you can uh, look at this through a standardized format and standardized means of evaluating and measuring uh, the, these assumptions that you have. So, so that's one, one, one decision point. Another decision point is uh, how digital is your process? So if the process happens almost exclusively through different systems and applications, process mining is a good is a good bet because as I explained before, it leverages the event logs in those systems to create uh, a visualization and a model of the process. Um, so you need those digital breadcrumbs for it to work. If you compare that with processes that happen in a legacy fashion, you know, e.g., paper processes, um, modeling would be a better uh, tool to start with because you're not going to be able to automatically generate that process. You're going to need to talk to specific people to understand how that process works. And again, this is an example of a lot of processes are probably part legacy, part digital. Um, so you can use some discretion or judgment to understand which one of these more so applies and which tool you should use to start. Um, the next one is that process mining is very useful for understanding improvement opportunities and the root causes. So when you see a bottleneck or discover a challenge, you can really get a second level of detail to understand, does this apply to a specific region, to a specific team? Um, what can I enter to a specific set of products or a specific set of activities? Uh, so it's really useful for doing that drill down. Uh, it's, it's going down a level. For process modeling, it's going up a level understanding how the processes link to business strategy and KPIs. So you, you might have also heard, um, I really don't know how what I'm doing today impacts the business or moves the business forward towards its corporate goals. Um, I, I hope that that isn't the position you're in, but you've probably heard it or maybe even experienced it yourself. And so modeling can help level up the process. Um, and that's good for executive communication. If you need to get buy-in, it's really important to link this improvement to the overall strategy. And then lastly, um, process mining is really good to evangelize what to move away from. Again, the as is and all of the challenges with the existing process, whereas modeling is really great to identify the future state and evangelize what to move to. Now, where you're at now is a combination of process mining and modeling in reality. Again, it depends what type of process you're, you're looking at. You'll need a combination of both to fully evaluate and map out your process. You'll need both mining and modeling. But more so, mining is used to help evangelize what to move away from. So then let's talk about how they work together. I have two slides here. Um, the first one is how mining helps improve modeling, and particularly how mining helps measure modeling. Um, and again, mine, if mining helps quantify the as-is process. Um, so it's going to give you some understanding of process metrics, uh, help you answer the question, how healthy is the process? This is in terms of... Uh, the goals that I mentioned at the beginning, the productivity of the process, the cost of the process, the compliance of the process. There could be specific line of business uh, 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 measurements for a specific process, things like revenue and sales, uh, things like reach and marketing, um, things like uh, days payable outstanding and accounts payable, whatever it is. The model isn't going to have that up-to-date information about the business, but mining is going to be able to get it for you out of the systems. 
It'll help you with opportunity sizing because again, it'll give you data to help understand what is the return on investment of improving this process? What is this gap? What's the, the cost of this? Um, as well as what investment do you need to make to capture that ROI? This will help you prioritize. You'll have a number of opportunities that are massive opportunities with a lot of work, opportunities that are massive that uh, don't take a lot of effort. Those are the ones you want to go after. But then you will have opportunities that um, or a high amount of work, but are a low opportunity. Um, and so that prioritization is helpful. You know, we'll talk about a little bit later about ROI, uh, but that sizing is really helpful to enrich the model, to understand the, the size of these problems. I already mentioned the root cause analysis. So you can understand which parts of the model are problematic through mining. And then lastly, conformance checking. Um, conformance checking really helps you understand is my as, how far is my as is from my 2B state? Um, is this process operating as it was designed? And if we look at that uh, from the other perspective, modeling contextualizes mining. Um, so I already spoke about this a bit, but in terms of the business strategy, what are the goals? Um, it doesn't matter if you're using an OKR framework, a KPI framework. Um, you really just want to answer the question, what's the bigger picture purpose of, these, of this process? How is it impacting the top line or the bottom line of the company? Um, modeling will give the mining data uh, additional information that you wouldn't be able to pull out of the system necessarily. Um, so who are the teams involved? What are the assets used in the process? Are there regulations that this process needs to comply with? What are the inputs and the output work products of the process? Are there programs associated with these? You know, all of those questions to really help contextualize the data that you're seeing in mining. Modeling can help provide that through the business architecture. Modeling also helps you create the gold standard. So again, the 2B, uh, you need to ask yourself, what does an ideal process look like? And we'll dive into this a little bit later, but specifically for your organization. Uh, one of the things I've seen uh, quite a bit in talking to customers is they went with a gold standard that was out of the box from uh, a number of different sources, and it didn't end up panning out because it didn't actually fit to their business. Um, so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but generally modeling can help you understand where you want to go, uh, which helps contextualize the mining of where you are. And again, conformance checking, this is a key point between the two. You can answer the question, is this process operating as designed? So you'll have noticed in the last two slides that conformance checking was a commonality between the two. Um, and I think that this is probably the biggest piece of how process mining and process modeling come together. Um, we talked about yin and yang, right? Uh, yin and yang is all about harmony, two different pieces, balance, uh, being together to create a, a, a better whole, a necessary whole. Um, and in this case, conformance checking really is that glue between the two. It, it, it answers that question of, you know, what is my as is compared to my 2B? So it'll, it'll help you answer questions like the ones you see on the slide. You know, how far away from ideal are we today? Um, if you're just starting, you might want to ask that question. If you're going through a change management initiative, you might want to understand how much progress have you made. It can also help you understand, did I get the ROI that I expected? So if the change management is 50% of the way there, how much of that total uh, return on investment have you been able to capture so far? Also for risk and compliance teams, um, I, I, I mean, I guess there's multiple teams actually, because the business is usually involved. Uh, if there's an internal or an external audit, uh, but particularly for risk and compliance teams, when they're undergoing an audit, it's not good enough to say, this is how I've designed the process and to show a model or a diagram or something like that. You need to actually prove that your business is operating in compliance with that design. So this is perfect for conformance checking to show you that you are complying or you aren't complying and you need to uh, get in compliance. Uh, it makes those audits a lot faster, more efficient, less costly. Um, it, it, it's absolutely beautiful in that regard. Um, it can help you, conformance checking can help you understand if people are embracing a change. Um, so there's, maybe there's a new system in place and you want to see, are people still using the old system? Are they performing some sort of shadow IT to circumvent, uh, the, the change that's being made? Um, and lastly, it can also help you identify what do you need to tackle next to move the needle farthest? If, um, if, it's a big change, right? If your desired 2B state, your gold standard is pretty far away from where you are today, there might be a number of things that you can change to get towards that desired state. Conformance checking will help you understand where the biggest gaps are. So I mentioned before, you can start in either place, mining or modeling, doesn't matter, there's no right answer here. 
Um, but you should be able to compare both. Um, and you should be able to see this conformance through either lens. Um, so for those of you that that third of the audience that said they use process mining, you should be familiar with the process maps that we say on the left. And for the third of you that said you were familiar with modeling, you should be able to see the BPMN models on the right. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar in the audience that weren't using either one, um, the left side is basically showing a visualization from process mining uh, where you can see the process and all of its steps and different connections between those steps. And on the right, you're seeing a BPMN model that's a standardized format for uh, diagramming processes that you can then connect with your business architecture. But the important point here is no matter where you started, you're obviously going to want to move to the other technology as well, because without both, you can't get that conformance checking. You can't get that harmony that you need. Um, so if you're in a process mining context, you'll be able to see visualizations that help you answer, you know, is my process running as designed? You can see where it's conforming, where it's not conforming. But importantly, you should also be able to see, are there steps missing? So maybe there were steps in my design model that aren't actually happening in reality. The data doesn't support it. So you should be able to see, you know, here's a step that's in my model that isn't happening in reality. Here's a path that's being taken that's in my model that doesn't happen in reality. And on the modeling side, you can answer the same question. You should be able to overlay the process mining data on top of uh, your reference model um, and answer the question, is my process running as design? But again, you should be able to uncover, is there missing information? So are there steps being taken in reality that weren't reflected in the model? And that can be good or bad. Um, maybe the step shouldn't be there. Maybe people are doing things that they shouldn't be doing. Um, or maybe when you were designing the model, you missed an important step of the process uh, that you only picked up through analyzing the system data through process mining. So again, it doesn't matter where you start. You should be able to get this comparison view between as is and to be, and you should be able to do it through either a process mining context or a process modeling context, assuming uh, you choose a, a, a vendor uh, to, that supports these. So a bit earlier, I said when I was discussing the framework of Discover Design Optimize that the transformation steps are only partially technology. There's also a very much human element of this, uh, the teams and the people involved with transformation. So let's look at some of the other components of success. And let's talk about how you can really put the pro in improvement, how you can leverage the technology that I just mentioned uh, to get the most out of it. Um, so the first point is that ROI is your currency. I've spoken to quite a few customers um, that have asked, where do I get started? Uh, how do I be effective? And if you look at the research that's available online, if you talk to analysts um, or if you talk to your peers, uh, we have seen success when people demonstrate ROI early and often, um, especially with the macroeconomic environment, you're probably not going to have the resources that you wish you had or the people on your team. Um, but you're not going to get budget to get those resources if you don't demonstrate value. So this is kind of the core tenant of process improvement that you want to focus on uh, as you're applying process intelligence. The second is to don't buy into standard models. I spoke about this a little bit earlier, but each business is really different. Um, yes, you have peers. Yes, you have competitors in your industries, but there are there is nuance to your business and that nuance is important. In some points, in, in some cases, it's actually competitive differentiation. So you need to make sure that your process is aligned to your business goals. And then when you're developing your best practice models, that they're uniquely yours. And then the third point is that you want to choose the right vendor. Um, so I mentioned that integrated process intelligence is better than the sum of its parts. So you want to make sure that the technology vendors that you're going with, um, you know, have the different components, certainly at least have mining and modeling, you know, additionally simulation automation are also beneficial as well. Um, but you need to have the right technology to realize the returns that we're talking about. And so I'm just going to jump into those one by one, uh, starting with ROI being your currency. Uh, again, from all of the conversations that I've had with customers, this is kind of the key point. Um, in, in fact, from a programmatic standpoint, um, if there's one thing you want to walk away from the presentation with, it's, it's keeping this in mind. From a technology standpoint, I, I have another takeaway for you. But um, ROI is really like my advice here is to start small, probably smaller than you think. Um, when you're implementing this technology, you don't need a real-time connection to the source systems right away. You don't need an enterprise-wide map of your business. You don't need all these additional attributes that you're not going to use for the initial analysis. Keep it simple. Keep it small. 
you should only need a couple of people to be able to run your first process intelligence project. Um, and you should be looking to target a well-defined uh, specific business opportunity within the process. So don't even start with improving the entire process. Pick one metric, KPI, OKR, whatever it is, one thing you're going to focus on. If you if someone has given you a mandate, that's the one to focus on. If um, uh, if you don't know, first of all, you could use mining to analyze and figure out, you know, what are the what are the set of opportunities that I could go after. But second of all, you can ask around. I'm sure you can hear someone complaining about a specific process that has a problem. And if you find that person, you found a key stakeholder. You found someone that if you're going to make their life better, they're going to sing your praises and you're going to, they're going to help you get buy-in, right? Um, once you do this, right, and you've tackled that problem and you've you've analyzed what the ROI is, you've, you've made the changes to actually tackle that ROI, that buys you the next step. At each of these phases, ROI is buying you the next step. Um, and that ROI is what's ultimately going to uh, build lasting business-wide transformation. So once you've tackled one opportunity, uh, I recommend you expand. Uh, and it, this isn't just me recommending. Again, this is based on my conversations with customers that have been successful in applying process intelligence. Um, you want to expand horizontally or vertically within that process. So vertically in terms of uh, maybe you looked at that process for a specific region and you want to now go global. Or maybe even it was a, a region within the United States and we go to the entire United States. Uh, so same problem, bigger volume. Or you want to expand horizontally. So maybe you picked one metric within that process uh, that you improved to get value. Now you pick another metric or another opportunity for improvement. Um, but you stay within the same process. At this point, you probably would have gotten a little bit of buy-in. So your couple of people has grown into a small group for improving processes. From there, once you generate value, you can expand to multiple processes across multiple lines of business. Um, if you are in a line of business in the audience, then this might not apply as much to you specifically. Um, you might be able to go upstream and downstream departments you work with. But um, if you're a process excellence professional specifically, or you're sitting in the center of excellence, this is the point where you can start to create that dedicated center of excellence uh, that services different lines of business with uh, process improvement um, methodologies and programs. Once you have a couple processes under your belt, you can work towards the end goal. Um, and this is very much about the journey, not the end goal. You can get towards the end goal of optimizing your entire business because you'll have an interconnected digital twin. You'll have all those processes and where they come together. And you can start looking at making changes that are not isolated to a specific area of a process, but really have an impact with knock-on impacts throughout the business. Um, and again, at this point, you're going to need that dedicated center of excellence to be able to achieve um, this kind of, uh, these kind of returns. Again, you only get there through showing ROI early and often. So the second point was to beware best practice. Um, I certainly believe that you should strive to turn best practice into standard practice. Like I don't have a problem with best practice specifically. Um, what I do have a problem with is when best practice comes from somewhere that doesn't apply to your business. Um, again, I, I strongly believe, and I've seen success with customers where they define their own best practice. They figure that out through using technology like process uh, intelligence, through talking to the right people internally, getting the right stakeholders together. Um, so when I say beware, um, there's a couple different sources where you might get best practice models that aren't exactly best practice. Um, now, I don't want to be a naysayer about any of these sources, right? I think, and I, I'm very honest here, I think all of these sources can be tremendously useful to help you identify where you want to go. Um, but you just need to be a little bit cautious. Um, so with software vendors, they might give you some sort of best practice model or best practice solution for a specific process. Um, and that can produce exponential returns, or it might just add complexity because chances are they probably want you to buy some more software to enact that best practice. It's their model, right? And that can be a good or a bad thing, but you need to be conscious of that when you're making the decision. For consultants, um, and I highly recommend working with consultants, they are a great source of domain expertise. Um, they can really help jumpstart a program for process improvement, um, but you wanna make sure that that expertise is tailored to your business. They're gonna have frameworks and methodologies, and some of those you should use, um, but you don't want to pay to, to migrate your entire program and your thinking to their methodology unless it makes sense for you. Um, it may or may not. Again, just something to look out for. And then last is reference data. This is information that can come from databases, searches that you find online, analysts, 
uh, you can get certain benchmarks to understand how's my process performance in terms of, you know, speed, rework, efficiency, um, or specific business objectives, uh, like, like revenue or sales cycle time or things like that. Um, it's an, it's just important to understand, does that reference data apply to your, to your business? Um, so is it in the same industry? Is it in the same company size? Is the basis on a reference data set of um, companies that look like you? Um, and chances are the reference data is not going to be perfect. It might be like a 75% overlap, like the companies are mostly the same, but they're not going to be perfect. Um, and so I would say you shouldn't strive for going for a benchmark unless you really feel like it represents uh, your business specifically. You can, of course, use that as a data point, and it's a worthwhile data point for um, combining and creating your own targets internally. And then the last point was choosing the right vendor. Pardon me. And of course, I work for iGraphics. You know, I'm going to tell you that iGraphics is the best solution. But uh, even more importantly than that, don't take my word for it. In fact, don't take any vendor's word for it. Um, you should be doing independent analysis. Um, make sure you look at the analyst reports that are out there examining the space. Make sure you look at customer reviews online. Try to talk to reference customers before you make a purchasing decision. Again, depending on where you started, starting, depending on your considerations, uh, things like the technology that you need, the costs, what the program looks like, there's going to be different vendors that work for you. Um, so you need to understand what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and to really make process intelligence effective, you, you need to make sure that you have the right vendor. Um, so make sure you get a, um, a good understanding of what the market actually looks like and what your options are. For iGraphics specifically, um, we, we can help you on your process intelligence journey. Um, we have those capabilities that I spoke about earlier, uh, and they're very integrated. So in terms of process modeling, um, uh, again, I think it was like 75% of uh, the audience said that you're using some sort of Lucid or Visio. Um, process modeling is a natural next step there because it allows you to add all of that business context that I mentioned. Um, it integrates with your diagramming tools. So we can, for instance, take diagrams out of a Visio and create them into BPMN uh, format that saves a lot of time when you're transitioning to process models. Um, it enables better collaboration around those processes um, and so on and so forth. For process mining, uh, we also enable process mining. You can discover those improvement opportunities I was talking about, and we offer conformance checking. The conformance checking is available both from that process mining view as well as the process modeling view, um, depending on how your business operates and where you want to start. Uh, there are review and approval cycles. So if you're familiar with the RACI framework, uh, that's a way of uh, codifying who is responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed. Uh, for a process or changes made to that process. We have cycles in our product that align to those um, that can help you keep product documentation updated, um, make audits easy, and make sure everyone's aligned on the process and the changes made to it. We have process simulation, which is something we didn't talk about uh, in this webinar in depth, but is also a very important next step um, as you're going through your process maturity journey which is you want to be able to understand the impact and the ROI of each change you're going to make before you make that change. Um, you do that by creating a baseline that you can get from process mining, how it's actually operating, and then running several what-if analysis uh, analyses. What if, uh, what if I deploy automation? What if I hire more people into this team? How is that going to impact the KPIs? So that's also a very important part of the equation as you, as you mature. Um, and then lastly, dashboards and reports. Um, I talked about the different perspectives around process. You want to make sure that each participant, whether it's an operator in the line of business, whether it's the risk and compliance team, whether it's an executive, uh, that they have the information about the process that they need and they can see the changes over time as you're improving them. And so last slide before we get to q and I will give one more one more shout uh, to what Fran had mentioned at the beginning, that if you do have questions, I am more than happy to answer them. Uh, please just make sure they're in the Q&A box and not the chat box, and that way I'm sure that I'll actually see them. Um, so in summary, uh, process intelligence is key to true business transformation. Um, good process builds lasting transformation. Bad process is expensive. If you want to deliver the business processes of the future today, you need to use process intelligence. 
Part of process intelligence, two key technologies, mining and modeling, produce exponential returns when used in tandem. You need to be able to do that conformance check. You need to be able to understand where you are today, where you're going tomorrow, and what the gap is. You can only do that by using these two together in an integrated way. And then lastly, your improvement journey and your processes are unique. Your business is unique, um, and you should you should respect that. That's that's perfectly fine. Um, the core principles of improvement are not unique, and these apply to every business. Um, you should focus on ROI. It's it's your currency. It's how you're going to scale your program. You shouldn't buy into best practice models unless they make sense for your specific business. And you should make sure you're choosing the right technology vendor uh, to help you get there um, in your process improvement journey. So with that, that's all I had. Um, and that's all we have time for today. We want to thank Max for his wonderful uh, knowledge sharing and for your participation audience. And if you enjoyed today's talk, then you don't want to miss the upcoming all access process mining and process intelligence webinar series that's happening March 5th and 6th right here with PEX Network. It's free to register and we hope to see you then. Bye bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.